From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to the special edition of Newsmakers, a debate between the two candidates for Fall River Mayor. The region's third largest city is still recovering from seeing a mayor convicted in federal court, and each of the con contenders say he is the one who can lead Fall River's recovery. Hello everybody, I'm Tim White. I will be moderating this exchange and asking questions along with my colleague, 12 News Politics Editor, Ted Nisi. Joining us in studio, the candidates for Fall River Mayor, incumbent Paul Coogan, and challenger Cliff Ponte. Mr. Coogan, Mr. Ponte, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, join us in this debate. As Sorry. always, there is no strict format. We are looking for an open and honest discussion of the issues. But if we feel you're not answering the question or taking too long, we will jump in. Uh, uh, and let's dive into the questions. And I want to start with the topic of marijuana because the issue has once again raised, was raised at a city council meeting this week. Last month, former mayor Jaisal Correa was sentenced to prison time for extorting businesses that wanted to open marijuana shops in the city. In the wake of that scandal, Fall River has sought to clean up how it gives local approval to marijuana operations. Mr. Coogan, the Herald News reported this month you announced you were over overhauling the pot shop process. Look, I don't need to tell you this was a massive stain on the city and a problem that was identified at the beginning of your administration. Why has it taken you two years to even begin to address it? Well, COVID. Uh, we had tackled it right away, but we didn't get through it. And all Other the communities faced the COVID outbreak, New Bedford, uh, I don't know if they did their applications then. We had to set up a process. We had no applications coming in. Uh, my opponent had six years on the city council to do something about zoning, an application process. They did nothing. We moved it forward. This year, um, we have a process in place now. We're going to go back and tweak it. We want to make sure we do it right rather than quickly and that's what we're doing we have nothing on the table right now as far as pot licenses and we're going to go forward with a process that's fair and transparent for everybody we want different layers so people know that when they come in it's not going to be like it was during the old days where you gave the uh, mayor a letter in the back seat of a car or you talked about money this is going to be an upfront process everybody's going to know the fees everybody is going to know who's on the panel and everybody's going to know how it goes I want to talk to you before we go to Mr. Ponte a little bit about the process that was set up. The application on your website, on the city's website, says the fee for a local approval is $50,000. Uh, an attorney at this week's city council meeting points out a city cannot generate revenue from a fee. It has to be revenue neutral. Is your process illegal? No, absolutely not. We looked, if you go to the uh, state CCC or to other communities across, um, Let's go to Seacom. They call it a donation of $50,000, and they put in another fee of $15,000 for a dog and police training. What happened initially was that it was called a fee. It may be called an application license. Those are the tweaks we're doing now. But the $50,000... Wouldn't that be the same thing? It might. Well, no, they use different terminology. Believe it or not, a donation, a fee, a license, uh, a license, a charge. There are words they use to get around it. We're going to use the most fair legal term we can use to make sure everybody knows exactly what we're doing. And going forward with that, it's going to be an open process. Overhaul on this was, like you said, one of the biggest stains in the history of Fall River. And we have a great team working on it. Um, we have one of the city councilors joined us, uh, Trot Lee. He volunteered to go on it when I spoke with him. Um, I think it's going to be a fair Okay, process. Mr. Ponte, as he points out, you're no bystander. The city council can also play a role here through oversight mm -hmm. and zoning, mm -hmm. but only months before the election does it seem you have become interested in this process. No, I don't think so. First off, I think that uh, where we are at as a city, one of the first order of business that this mayor should have done, my opponent should have done while taking office, is vet the process better, not wait for almost a year and a half as his administration to start working on a new process and telling the floor of Herald News that there's no shenanigans happening after things were percolating from these individuals who were upset about the process. What should have happened is the mayor should have started a process within days of taking office. We had a mayor that was caught dealing with marijuana vendors and kickbacks that is going to federal jail. We should have been able to set an example from within days of taking office that we are going to redo the process. If he wants to say that we have a Fall River Cannabis Control Commission, that should have happened from day one. We only have a Fall River Cannabis Control Mission within the last two weeks or the last month. So we, we should have done things better from my perspective, uh, from a counselor's standpoint. Do you standpoint? give n no credit to what his uh, excuse was, which was COVID, of course, 
uh, sucked all the oxygen well, out of the well, room? Well, it, it did, but that wasn't the only thing happening in, 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 in other cities and towns, but only in Fall River. COVID just seemed to consume city government. Other towns like Taunton, New Bedford, Attleboro, Providence, other towns were able to improve efficiencies and work on things that may have been neglected because things ha things are so busy during you know the day-to-day -day operations of running city government. Mm -hmm. COVID did dominate most of our lives the last couple of years. However, there, there was still opportunity, in my opinion, where we could have improved efficiencies, we could have looked at policies, we could have looked at financial policies, and actually utilized that time to make sure things got done the correct Mr. way. Mr. Coogan, before I go to you for a 30-second response, I do want to ask you, $50,000 fee under the Ponte administration, if you win, would that remain? We are going to, we are, we are going to look at what is legally right to do. We ha I will have my corporation counsel as well as a, a legal team look into the process of vetting vendors as well as making sure that the application process is fair and equitable for everybody. Mr. Coogan, 30 seconds. Yeah, let, let's be clear. He was there for six years throughout <clears throat> all these indictments, throughout the arrests. He actually served as acting mayor for a few months at the end. Nothing. Nothing was done at all. No attempt to zone an area of the city, no attempt to set up a process. We inherited this mess and we went to work. Granted, COVID did set us back. I, I'll take all the blame in the world for that. But at the same time, when you sit there for six years in the eye of a storm and you do nothing, I'm not going to take full responsibility. Final word, 30 seconds. With all due respect, the city council doesn't run day-to-day -day operations. The city council does not sit there and send orders down to other city councilors. It is the mayor's job to run the city's day-to-day -day operations. That is his job. That is his responsibility. He set up a former cannabis control commission literally a month ago. He's been mayor for a year and a half. He appointed a former city councilor two weeks ago when he's been mayor for almost a year and a half. That shows you that he does not have the ability to lead, and this was not a priority of his until this, these individuals and this couple who was, who was, is, uh, who was making comments of not being treated correctly came out. Okay. All right, Mr. Ponte, uh, I want to stick with you because as we talk about commitment, your entire campaign has yes. been dogged by this letter. You sent your colleagues at your real estate office at the time of your kickoff where you described the job of mayor as, quote, ceremonial. You've, you've talked about this. You've yes. said it was a mistake. But voters may think, well, when he thought we weren't going to find out, he told people he sees the job as ceremonial, but the letter leaks and now he says he doesn't believe that. Why would you write that? What were you thinking? So I was trying to relieve the staff of agents that work in my office. I'm proud to say that I own a successful real estate company in Fall River. We have an office in Dartmouth, and we are a very su successful firm. As a real estate broker for the firm, my duty and responsibility is to have the agents that work under my broker license make sure that they're following the rules, following policy, doing what they need to do as real estate professionals. I made a mistake. I, I was trying to relieve my staff and, and say things in that correspondence to them for they would understand that I am, I am still going to be there for them if they need a question. I'm still going to be their friend. I've, I've helped many agents in their lives make a big difference so they can support their families. But ceremonial, which is we both know the con ceremonial sounds like you show up, you pat, you know, some, kiss some babies and go back to work. Well, sure. Well, part, part of the job of being mayor is, is truly ceremonial. Part of the job of mayor is also to make sure that you hold department heads accountable, make sure you set a vision. I'm a visionary. I'm a guy who, who can be in front of department heads or in, in his own company and say, I have a vision, I have expectations, these are my visions, and these are my expectations. And I think I could take those traits, bring them to the office of mayor. I've acknowledged that that was a mistake. I should have used my words differently. We've all made mistakes. I know my opponents made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. I've learned from my mistakes, and I think we all should. Mr. Coogan, you have made hay out of that letter, this whole campaign, and your support Voters have to, but we often hear from voters who say they want elected officials who have private sector experience. And the level of criticism you've dealt with, Mr. Coogan, could leave voters thinking you don't think anyone with a private business who doesn't want to give that up or retire can run for mayor. How do you square that? Well, that's a pretty silly question. Let's be real. He just said to you that he was doing that for his staff. The public doesn't have a right to know of how he sees the position. Let's get real here. He wrote a, a, a public memo, as far as I'm concerned, and sent it out to the voters talking about a part-time position, a ceremonial position. He, he has no right to keep that information from the voters. If that's the job he's going to do, cut cords and kiss babies, then that's what he should say. Why would he run from it now? Because it became public. Because it was a mistake? I agree with you 100%, Ted. He, it came out, and he ran from it. But he knows he didn't say it. 
I've said things I wish I hadn't said. I really have. But at the same time, when you sit down and write a memo, you, I'm hoping you proofread it. I'm hoping you type it again. I hope you use backspace on the sections you don't like. But he didn't. He sent it out as is. I, understandably, I will not leave my position as a broker. I'm going to be there for you all the way through it. When he, was, uh, when he was questioned about it, he didn't say it was a mistake at first. He kept saying it was a private memo. That's a public memo. All right, this that, has been discussed yeah. a lot. This can be, I'm going to give you 15 seconds, and we are going to move on. Full-time leadership means you don't wait to make decisions when you have a superintendent running roughshod over city employees who are bullying and harassing people. That's the full-time leadership that this mayor is saying he's doing. He's running away from issues. He's running away from decisiveness. He's had more press conferences since I announced my run for mayor right, in June. Be beyond 15 it, it, can't, it can't answer the question. He knows he's running I've already from answered it. the he's, question. He's running from it. I, I've already answered the question. Yeah. And I've already, I've, already, I've already stated my position. It was a mistake. Where I'm still waiting it? for the Where full- Where did you get it? Where did I get what? I've that already addressed it. was a ceremonial it. position. Well, I think you've, you've documented these last two years. No. It's been nothing but ceremonial no, to where you. No, did you get Because it? you haven't made any full-time decisions. Still, or made any, still waiting and for still, an answer. I'm still waiting for decisiveness. I'm still waiting for you to acknowledge the fact. Let's look at the budget. I'm still waiting for, let's talk about the budget. We are going to talk about the budget. We will, all right, we have, right, we right, will get to the budget in a second. Let's reset this. We're going to do a rapid fire. We want to hear cover a few questions very quickly. Looking for one or two word answers. Mr. Coogan, to you first. Yes or no, should there be term limits for mayor? Yes. How long? I would like to see two four-year terms. If I was the person making the policy, I'd like to see two four-year terms. I'd like to see term limits throughout. All right, you actually covered two questions in sorry, one. So sorry, no, it's okay. Sorry. That's all right. Mr. Ponte, uh, term limits. I agree with my opponent. Oh, two four-year terms. Yes. Okay. Former Mayor Jaisal Correa uh, was sentenced to serve six years in prison. Mr. Ponte, was that a long enough sentence for the crimes? I don't think so. How long do you think he should have gotten? Um, I, I think uh, at least 10 years or something mm -hmm. like that. Mr. Coogan. I'll trust the system. I didn't hear all the evidence, so uh, the judge and the jury heard it all, and that's where it ended up. Six years is good. It's not my call. All right. Uh, Mr. Coogan, there are currently 212 sworn personnel in the Fall River Police Department. The budget indicates that can grow to 235. The question is, is 235 officers the right number, not enough, or too many? I'd say that's up to the chief. I know we're trying to put another class. We have don't have an opinion on how many officers there should be in the police no, department? No, I don't know how they staff. I don't know what the rotations are on shifts. What? It's my position that the chief makes the call on that, along with his deputies and administrative team. If he tells me he needs 250, that's the right number. If he tells me he needs 220, that's the right number. I trust the chief, and I do depend on him for wisdom. And if he says 235 is the number, we're going to 235. Mr. You Ponte. mean to tell me that the mayor of this city well, doesn't... Well, let me hear your answer first. 235. We don't have enough police officers on our streets and I've been the only candidate in this race that has been advocating to restructure and reorganize our police department. We've got 214 sworn police officers. We're having a hard time getting 10 to 12 police officers to patrol our streets any given time this summer. We have a police department whose morale is in the tank. We have a police department who's overworked. We have a police department who has a comp time and an overtime issue. We have some serious problems in our department. If I'm elected mayor, one of my responsibilities is going to take what we have the 214 police officers that we have and make sure we reorganize and add more police officers on our streets. Now my opponent has since added 11 new police officers by using one-time money which sets up structural deficits with OPER. So that is not good business and I, we're going to be, we have some strong, tough financial decisions that need to be made because of the decisions this administration Let's just has tell made. people ARPA is the American Recovery <laughs> Plan Act, that's the Federal Money Rescue Act that was uh, uh, sent for, to deal with the pandemic. I'll let you respond to it. Because it's an outrage. He wants to talk about public safety. He had a $30,000 grant in front of him to vote yes or no on verifying the addresses of sex offenders to keep the community safe, to keep the children safe, to keep the elderly safe. The police are outraged. He voted no. He doesn't even want to do that. That's a basic fundamental principle of public safety. Where do people on parole or probation live so we know that we're keeping the residents safe and away from them? He voted no. The vote went to him at 5 to 2. It was already over. Even symbolically, he couldn't vote yes. All right. So we... This has been litigated a lot, too. I want to get to Ted. I'll give you 15 seconds to respond. Yeah, so the process in the city council, when we get a grant, we refer it to our subcommittee, and we find out if there's a matching grant. The mayor just, like he says to school committee members, don't worry about it, just vote. We don't get in the weeds, move on. That's not how I govern. I govern to represent the community and make sure that we have all of the answers. All right, we're going to turn to the budget and the city's finances. Um, mayor, uh, Mr. Coogan, we're going to start with you. Your finance director told the council on Tuesday night 
Fall River is facing a deficit of estimated of over $5 million next year, and it would be $10 million if you weren't planning to raise taxes extra to pay the Durfee High Bond. When voters approved the high school debt in 2018, they were told the average homeowner would pay an extra $115 a year. What is that amount going to be now? Well, that, that was I think it was $115 on a $250,000 house. That's, 200 something, yeah. It was 200 something. At but the time. so for that, for the equivalent, it's what the is same, it now? It's the, oh, I don't know what the tax is now on a $300,000 house. I can't do the math in front of you. But it's going to go up proportionately <laughs> on the value of the property, the same as it was then. Um, that's what we. But for the average house, it, what is it going to be on the Durfee debt exclusion when it, when that goes in next? Well, year? I don't know what the average house price is. 260 or 270, isn't it? In Fall River right now? No, you're the man. <laughs> I, t I think it's around 270 So just add 10 or $20. So do you expect to put the full Durfee bond amount I hope on not. top? Well, I, that's, that's a different question. Well, My position is if there's ways to save money or uh, reduce the levy on the Durfee debt, absolutely. We've, we've had that debt in the budget for two years. And the only reason it came out early was because the bond interest rates were so low. Uh, they were factored on the initial... Uh, funding for the school at 5%. Uh, the, the chief financial officer was able to buy bonds at 1%. So she grabbed them when she could because over the life of that bond, she's probably going to save the residents 40 or $50 million. So it was a good move. But at the same time, it threw those, those monies into the regular budget. We didn't put the override in early. We didn't put the override in But early. you're looking at $10 million between the override and the $5 million well, deficit not, that's, next year. But that's year. not fair. The voters decided they wanted that bill to go on their uh, on the taxes in 2023. That was not Paul Coogan. It was not Cliff Pond. He supported it when it came to the uh, city council, and I'm glad he did. But that was up to the voters. They made the call on when that was going in. And the reason it got a little messy was because some people thought it should have went in earlier. All right, and Mr. I think it should have gone in when we told the voters. Mr. Pawnee, that, uh, you've talked about this issue a lot, but the mayor says this is exactly what the voters signed up for when they agreed to float the bond so, to the high school. So, so the, the residents of this community, first, I'm happy he acknowledged the fact that we have a $5.4 million budget deficit because we had to pretty much add, ask for a freedom of information request to get that information because he didn't want to share it a couple of weeks before the election that the city has some financial problems. I'm happy he admitted to that. In addition to that, he, as the leader of the project to go out and get people to vote for Durfee High School, actually went out and said that it's going to cost the residents of this city $3.6 million over seven years. However, it's now because of mismanagement, lack of making decisions, having expenses that have increased almost $18 million from the previous fiscal year, we actually are going to have to pay almost $5 million for the debt exclusion for 30 years. That has since changed. We have a $10 million budget deficit. This mayor's CFO actually said to the city council, they have no choice, Here's her, word, her words, no choice but to go to the debt exclusion next year. The debt exclusion is going to be upwards of almost $5.5 million. He has to go to the debt exclusion because he hasn't done anything to reduce expenses. Well, look, all right, you, and you, you're asking them to give you the job next week. Yes. If you are to become mayor, you will inherit those numbers. Yes, I will. What will you do? Will you just be raising taxes the same way his administration That will be the last priority of my administration. But then how are you, it's easy in the election. Sure, how, absolutely, and I'm happy to address that because my opponent doesn't have any priorities over the next two years. He has 100 $100,000 office upgrades at City Hall. He's having employees spend $500 on coffee machines. We have issues within city government where we have lawsuits that are going through the roof because of uh, uh, issues within our school department that he just let happen with a, another superintendent. And, and those things need to be brought in. You think that's in. $10 million of savings you just listed? I, I, I'm, no, I'm saying, I'm saying that we need to, first off, I'm not the mayor. All right, I'm the city council president. Department heads don't report to me, they report to him. He runs the day-to-day -day operations. I'm telling you, my promise to the residents of this city is to make sure that we are lean and competent in every single department. We need to make sure that we try to find cost savings. $100,000 office upgrades isn't it. Having 1.5% increases and almost $2.2 million in increased uh, positions in this fiscal year. That is not the way we save money. This mayor hasn't looked at expenses. He's done nothing but just increase revenues. Look, yeah, for, uh, the, for the Mr. Coogan, for the voter listening, they might get overwhelmed by all these numbers, worried. but they are going to be worried that the yeah. taxes are going to go up significantly. The taxes are going to go up what they voted for, not for what Cliff Pont wants, not for what Paul Coogan wants. My position is very clear. That's not going to be a 30-year bond because we have a number of elementary schools coming off in, in um. I think it's 2030 or 2029. Green, Viveris, don't hold me to the names of the schools. But when that money frees up, those bonds are paid off, we can transition that money 
to Durfee as we told him. He doesn't understand that there is a pool of money sitting out there on the horizon that we can get to. And as far as the actual rate for what it is, it's going to be what we told them. We, we, uh, we told them a number. We're going to go with that number till we get the school done. I'm extremely proud of Durfee. I'm glad we went through it. I'm glad we renovated the whole thing. And I think it's going to be a, uh, a big plus for the community for a long time. I do want to ask you, Mr. Coogan, one other question on finances while we're on this. Earlier, uh, last month, we surveyed all the region's major cities to find out how much they've allocated an American Rescue Plan so far. So far. Your office told us you'd only allocated $260,000. Right. But the other night at the council, your finance director said nearly 20 times more than that has been used, about $5 million, to plug a hole in the budget. Why didn't you disclose that? No, it was, it was disclosed to the council a long time ago. The but when we revenue. asked all the other cities, they, they who were... Who did you talk to? We talked to New Bedford. We no, talked but to who did you talk to in, in our city? Your spokesperson. I, I have no idea who you spoke with, but the lost revenue was out front right from the get-go. It ended up getting reduced because we weren't able to use the 4.9. It went down to 2.9. But we use that money, and we have a program with the Fall River Police for Public Safety called Operation Compass that's going to be coming out, and we're going to have some announcements this week and on where the money's going. Before we move on, Mr. Pine, one last, <laughs> only 30 seconds on this, but that is a way that you're allowed to use American Rescue Plan funds. You've been criticizing him a lot for it, but if you lose revenue because of the pandemic, you're allowed to plug the budget. Lost revenue. However, we... we this mayor has utilized, we are the only city in the area that used opera money to balance their budget. It's irresponsible. Providence did that? Yeah, no, Providence well, used the lost revenue component, but they did not have actual positions, 29 positions, salaries based on opera money. Fall River is the only city of the mayors that I've spoke to. I've spoke to other mayors in our area. They did not use it to balance their budget. And I also want to speak about his comments too about debt retiring off. I was briefly, at Diamond, briefly. I was at, yeah. very briefly, I was at Diamond today. Okay, they want a $293 million school. The city of Fall River, the, the city is going to be responsible for almost $80 million of that over the next couple of years. So in fiscal year 2024, that's going to raise our debt to almost $2.5 million. How are we going to pay for it when we already have a deficit? All right, we have to do this question very quickly so we have time to get to uh, closing statements. Uh, Mr. Ponte, there's a proposal for a regional charter school in Bristol County called Innovators Charter School to open next year that would serve both New Bedford and Fall River students. Do you support or oppose that plan? Support. Why? Uh, I'm a charter school alum. I went to Atlantis Charter School in Fall River. The school did great for me. I think we need to allow our students in Fall River to be innovative and creative. That's the purpose of a charter school. It had tremendous impacts on my life, and I'm sure that uh, each child, whether it's at Atlantis or Argosy or another charter school, will be provided an education that is second to none so that they can become productive and adaptable lifelong learners. Mr. Coogan, support or oppose? I oppose that one. I support Argosy and um, Atlantis. Those are two existing schools that are not at full enrollment yet in their in their high school uh, programs if that's what we need extra seats for then we'll talk about it I also know the people that are behind it and some of them I'm not I don't have the utmost confidence in I do have confidence in Atlantis and Argosy right now Mr. Coogan we were just talking about the finances one way to improve city finances is to uh, have economic growth in the city so I'm wondering what do you think is the single single biggest economic development opportunity Fall River has right now I think coming up is going to be Route 79. Uh, the amount of money that can go into there for residential, um, retail, um, and all environmentally friendly stuff, that's going to be over a billion dollars along our waterfront and it can transform the front of the city. I think that that's going to be a major focus going forward long after my term's gone on, but it can lead to a, a lot of additional tax money and a uh, better quality of life for all our residents. Mr. Ponte, same question. Single biggest economic development opportunity Connect, for Fall River. Connecting our waterfront to our downtown to provide opportunities for our small businesses to succeed. I think government with the one-time money that we have should be supporting local big businesses in their economic uh, growth and in their process for growing and, uh, and, and, and being benchmarks in our community for many years to come. All right, we have about one minute left before we uh, get to closing uh, statements. This has been a tense campaign. It's been a tense debate, I would say, sitting right in front of you two gentlemen. So I want to ask sort of a different question, let a little air out of the balloon. This uh, debate will be airing primarily on Halloween. Mr. Ponte, at the Ponte household, what do you give trick-or-treaters? Uh, I, I say uh, numerous amounts of chocolate. All different kinds of chocolate. You don't have a favorite chocolate? That no, you I like used to? my grandparents used to do uh, chocolate uh, um, potato chips. But I don't have the time since I've been campaigning to order them, so 
uh, different kinds of chocolate. All right, a lot of voters <laughs> might be considering this when they go to the polls, yeah. Mr. Coogan. So your future <laughs> voters, those trick or treaters. If they don't want chocolate potato chips, they can get Reese's Pieces or Baby Ruth, the Heath bars, or things like that at our house. <laughs> a diversity of candy. Did I say uh, chocolate potato chips? <laughs> you did say chocolate. I didn't mean chip. that. Potato chips. <laughs> All right. He gets extra time to amend the question. <laughs> All right. Like, why don't we both get uh, to closing <laughs> statements? Uh, the order of which was drawn randomly prior to this debate. Each candidate will get one minute. And first up is Mr. Ponte, your 60-second closing statement. Thank you. I would like to thank um, you guys for having us here. I want to thank the region uh, for listening, and I want to thank the Fall River voters for instilling the confidence in me to serve as your city councilor for the last six years. This city is at a crossroads. You can decide to continue to have status quo government, or you can have an innovative leader, a leader that's stepping up to the plate to be an outside-of-the-box thinker, somebody who has priorities for free universal pre-K, repaving our streets on a consistent basis, making sure we re organize our police department by adding more police on our streets today, not waiting for two years. We got to make sure we reorganize government to make sure that we improve efficiencies and making sure that we are lean and competent in every single department. I will take a look at all of our city finances and I will make sure I take the same approach that I, br that I have brought to my business success to the mayor's office. Look folks, success does not just happen. We need a plan to make it happen. And I am the one in this race that is here for the long haul. I am here to make sure that this city is going to be a city of great hope and great opportunity. On Tuesday, November 2nd, I need and ask for your vote for mayor of Fall River. And one thing I promise you, you will get nothing but my very best. All right, thank Mr. You. Ponte, thank you very much. Now, Mr. Coogan, your 60-second closing statement. Uh, this is a contrast race for the city of Fall River. Uh, I'm a mayor that's out in the community out amongst the people at the events. Uh, my opponent, uh, the other night we were at the Liberal Club and he was talking to the firemen, but at the same time, I thought about it afterwards, the firemen's memorial where we honored 22 firefighters that lost their life in the, uh, in the line of duty. He didn't show up, I was there. When the, when, the, uh, when the protests hit, I marched with both the police and the protesters to try to make sure things went peacefully and the residents in Fall River had less to worry about. As he explained in the last debate, during that time he was on the phone. He was contacting other councilors, he said. My position is, if you want honest, transparent government, you're going to stick with me. We're down there working every day to try to get a better city for all of our residents, whether it's public safety, education, economic development, anything going forward that can make Fall River a better place to live for everybody, I'm going to be doing it. And if, as we have a new council president coming on, no matter who's the mayor, we're going to be able to move forward, hopefully with a new team that's going to make Fall River a better, a safer place for everybody. Mr. Coogan, thank you very much. Mr. Ponte. We both appreciate you joining us for this debate. They're not easy, but they are important. If you missed any of it or last week's debate with the two candidates for Attleboro mayor, you can catch it right now on WPRI.com or you can subscribe to the Newsmakers podcast. And as they said, November 2nd is Election Day. We will have the full results on WPRI.com and 12 News. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.